Uh, hello everyone, um, good afternoon and welcome to our webinar implementing business critical projects in your sleep. My name is Angela Hasty, and I'm the marketing specialist here at Jade and I'll be facilitating the webinar today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, my fellow presenters today. I have with me here in the office, uh, Mark Fabris, who's the head of digital at Zurich and Michael Busby, who's an experienced designer at Jade Software is joining us from Christchurch. Why don't you tell us a bit about your role as head of digital? No worries, thanks, Ant. Um, so I head up our digital team at Zurich, and the key focus across our team uh, is looking after the touch points and experiences that we provide for advisors and end customers, which includes portals, so access portals, uh, mobile and web experiences. So part of that is looking to leverage our existing platforms and improve their use and the capabilities that then support our overall business strategy. Awesome. And Michael, what does an experience designer do? Cheers, Ant, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, so experience designer, also known as user experience designer or UX. Um, what I do is I help clients solve their digital problems so and ensure that we're designing the right, right thing for the person. So our process is to achieve this. We first do research with end users, um, actually talk to them, understand their pain points and what can we solve. And then we design the right solution based on those insights we find from that research, which then gets into kind of more traditional wireframing, um, prototyping work. Awesome, thanks guys. Um, so we're here to talk about business critical projects. Um, so Mark, what's, what was your business critical project and how did it come about? Okay, so Zurich's uh, life business in Australia is largely focused on working through intermediaries or financial advisors. And a key part of the journey for advisors is the, the quoting and, and application process. The process they go through to um, look at alternative scenarios for clients and then the fulfillment basically, which is applying and, and having cases underwritten. The program was basically to replace what we had uh, in place for our quote and application platform completely and uh, improve the experience overall. And so quite a significant part of the journey and a significant uh, investment in effort uh, and importance for us uh, last year. So you are essentially looking to replace a part of what you offer. Um, I assume there would have been many stakeholders. Can you tell me a bit more about you know, who you were dealing with? Absolutely. So the predominant stakeholder uh, for this platform are financial advisors uh, at the end users. And as I said, in independent advisors. Other users uh, externally would also be their support staff, so office staff, uh, but we also use the software internally. So internally we have uh, you know, operational and, and sales staff uh, that uh, would use the software or a variation of the software. Um, we also help support you know, completion of applications through a tele-interviewing process internally. So it is quite critical and impacts quite a number of uh, internal and external stakeholders. Right, so I'd imagine that there would be uh, quite a few competing priorities. So how do you go about, how did you go about defining the scope of the project and the actual requirements? Well, it was a bit of a process. I'd say um, initially it was quite clear that we had a, a job at hand. We knew that uh, the platform that we had in place wasn't quite up to scratch. It wasn't doing what we needed to do. So we went through a process of gathering this feedback and that was sort of external feedback through our sales team. We went across internally our various stakeholders and gathered various um, feedback and requirements and went through a sort of a prioritizing and validation process internally. And based on that, we then went um, more broadly externally to our advisor force to, um, to get their feedback and survey their various needs and thoughts on, on anything from functional requirements or how the system was performing, um, devices that were being used and the like. And so that basically fed into sort of the decision making process more broadly around the program uh, and helped sort of the, the initial funding to, to kick the program off. I guess I wanted to touch a bit more on how you went through the process of finding the right partner. Why did you look for a partner? Well, I guess I am um, personally, I'm very keen on, um, you know, we talk about uh, the customer at the centre. And, and considering the, the customer's need. For us, the core customer is, is our advisor, advisor user, as well as our end customers. Um, you know, I've had an interest in growing what we do around design and considering this program was looking at a complete replacement of a key part of the journey. It was critical for us you know, to do it properly. 
I'd had experience in other parts of, of Zurich, um, sort of globally, where we'd um, done some, some pretty good work around design, largely in around Europe, and was keen for us to accelerate or, or increase the use of, of design locally. So that kind of at least got the support and the funding to bring um, some design into the process. Right, so how did you come about working with Jade? Well, I was, uh, had already sort of seen Jade around in the industry. Um, I was aware of, of Jade's experience otherwise. Uh, importantly, as much as design was the number one focus, I, I wasn't too keen on design from uh, someone who was, didn't have domain expertise, who didn't have familiarity with the industry and the market. And so what I did like around the fact that, that Jade had um, the digital and, and market experience um, to, to back in you know, what I was after around the design thinking part of the process. And so initially, um, not having a direct experience, we ran a small program as basically a little tester um, to then get ourselves familiar with the process, yeah. uh, get ourselves you know, familiar with, uh, with what, what Jay did and, uh, and how the, uh, you know, the process worked. I guess the one last question I had around this before we jump into um, looking at the process for the project and the timeline is um, collaboration. It's often important when you're having different stakeholders, uh, especially partners. How early did you engage Jade and did this help to drive the collaboration? Yeah, so I'd say the, the simple answer is very early. Uh, this was a, quite a tricky program overall because we were bringing in a number of vendors um, to replace the existing platform that was in place. So collaboration with multiple vendors was key. Uh, we've, we had basically a, a separate front end vendor across the, the experience, um, an underwriting rules engine provider at the, the back end of the software. Um, and so we needed to be able to bring those pieces, pieces together appropriately and know that the, uh, you know, the parties and partners could uh, deal, well, uh, deal well together. And so as much as we brought design in at the outset, we also made sure that we had the incorporation of the other partners um, you know, through the, the discussion, through the dialogue, and so that it was a, a good joint effort. Awesome, thank you. Um, digging into the project a bit more, so this uh, screen here that you're seeing, um, this is a project timeline, I guess. What, what is the main objective, what was the main objective of the project, Mark? Um, Pretty easy to say as experience, uh, the experience that we we're providing. We knew that what we were doing for advisors wasn't good enough and we wanted to go next level. And so the bottom line was, wasn't about efficiency and process. It was about the experience we we're providing to our end users. The secondary um, part to the process was around future readiness. So the way we approached what we did technically was important to be able to accommodate you know, the moving market the moving trends and what was around the corner. And so fundamentally experience, but backing in in future readiness. So Michael, did you want to talk us through the process of the um, project? Yeah, sure. So before we go into kind of solution mode, the first thing was to, you know, talk to actual advisors to understand um, how they use the existing tool, you know, what plan points they have, but also just how they do their job, you know, what workarounds, um, gaps we can find that can help influence the new solution. So we uh, did, you know, a week or two of research and then we summarized what we found into kind of one one document, which we then used as kind of our base point for all our insights of what our end users um, are asking for. And then to get everyone back on the same page, we kind of conducted a workshop with um, Zurich as well as development and kind of key subject matter experts to kind of talk through what we found um, and where we should go. And so from there, we then spent three weeks, you know, designing a prototype for user testing. And then again to testing it uh, as our check-in point at back with advisors again to make sure we're heading the right direction. And then after that was kind of continuous of um, more design work to kind of refine areas which haven't been worked on yet. And then we transition to what's called production design, which is kind of getting designs ready for development. And then to kind of wrap it all up, we did a final phase of a uh, user testing with the beta version, so the developed version, um, which was kind of then our our point to then just you know, iron out, you know, usability issues or small tweaks that can be fixed before we kind of release it to the to the wider public. Yeah, so th I guess these projects can carry a fair amount of risk. What, you know, what are the deliverables? Will they actually solve the problem? What about uptake usability? How did you go about de-risking it, the project? Yeah, so for the, the design phase of creating the prototype initially, um, 
to kind of de-risk what we're doing, but always refer back to the initial research to make sure that we're designing for the, the right problem. We're not just designing based on our assumptions of what we'd like. So that, that research is always our backbone for the design work, but then to validate that design work as well, that's where the user testing is so critical to de-risk um, what we're doing. So the user testing, that one week block, uh, was also just to iron out usability issues early on, but also just to test um, concepts, get first impressions, make sure you know, it's, it's resonating with actual end users um, early on. So that's before any development work goes on um, quite early in the piece. Mark, do you think it de-risked the project? What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, well, I guess, um, as I think through that, to a degree, I was handing off the de-risking of the advisor needs to Jade, um, because as I, as I sort of worked through, a, a critical part for us was internal stakeholder management. And the process was great, whereby I was, to a degree, excluded from the advisor interview process, so I wasn't muddying the waters. Um, so it was, it was a good way to actually in cleanly obtain or, or get to the bottom of the needs without, as I say, it being muddied or you know, by um, uh, other, other thoughts that were feeding into it. We then um, fed back the process and the learnings back internally, um, particularly through our sales team, to make sure that we were engaging them along the way. And a big part of the risk wasn't simply our external users, but it was going to be our internal users, our sales team, and those various stakeholder groups being happy with the end product. Yeah. And so I think a big part of this was that engagement and being able to have you know, progress, whether it's prototypes, initial designs or whatever, to, to feed through those, those internal stakeholder groups. And that I think was a significant um, impacting factor in, in helping the change, helping people uh, be satisfied with where we're going and then what we eventually executed on. We'll move into a bit more around the, the actual process and show you guys some of the uh, outputs of it. So this um, screen that you can see now is um, a picture of the output of the research phase. So Buzz, do you want to tell us a bit more about you know, what this phase is all about? What did it involve? Yeah, so the actual research phase was um, us, uh, myself and a colleague, we went out to uh, advisor firms um, and spoke to advisors one-on-one. -on -one. So we conducted eight sessions of doing this. Each session was about an hour and a half, um, and there was with 11 advisors in total. So you know, we're talking about how they use the existing tool, but also you know, how they do their job, um, how does that existing tool fit into their process. And for the, our key thing is just to really fully understand of what they do. And after we spoke to advisors and you know, a few admin staff as well, we then collate all our findings into a solo uh, document, which is what you see here. So it ended up being about a 16 page of document, you know, um, highlighting what we've learned and then what our recommendations based off that. Um, and so again, this is really a good base point in terms of you know, collating what we heard from advisors and then Zurich can use as well to kind of you know, match up what they hear, but also it's kind of independent research they can take away with. It's a good point. I, I should just add that that is a document and the output within it is one that we referred back numerous times through the program just to check in whether we were actually heading towards you know, those goals that were set um, from the research. Yeah, that's awesome. So I guess I have one question around the advisors. So how many did you interview? Yeah, so it was 11 in total um, and that was over eight sessions and yeah, everyone, each one was an hour and a half, which um, is really key to kind of really hear their stories and you know the pain points that they have. So 11 people in total, is that enough to get robust results? It is for the work that we do. So that's what we call qualitative research. We just want to understand um, stories and pain points. And what you find actually is, you know, after five or six of those interviews, you start to hear all the same patterns because, you know, people do their job all slightly different, but they're all the same pain points and workarounds which they have. And so typically we kind of aim for that eight to 10 um, number in terms of, uh, this qualitative approach, but to also cross check the findings that we have, we do quantitative research as well, which are typically surveys. And fortunately, Zurich had done um, previous survey work with advisors as well, which was over, I think, 300 independent advisors. So we were able to kind of cross check the raw data from that with the stories that we heard from our research as well. I guess the, the next stage is all around um, what you do next with this research, right? This is, what, you're at a workshop here. What, can you explain a bit more about this? Yeah, so after that research, um, 
our core goal was then to get everyone back in the same room and kind of talk about what we've heard and what is the direction next. And so what you see on the wall there is actually what we call the advisor journey. So we mapped up on the wall um, kind of the, the core process of what an advisor does from, you know, um, engaging with a client, uh, using tools to find out results, getting into the quoting tool, the application um, feature. We mapped that all out and then also spoke about, you know, what areas of that process is a pain point of frustration for advisors right now you know that being the area to focus on um so that was kind of a one-day workshop and we structured it so it would bring in different subject matter experts during the day to kind of talk about core piece which relates to them um and we can kind of then refine you know what what can be solved and what direction they could take um and then from that workshop you know i mean everyone was on the same page and we kind of understood where we're going to go next after that Great. So I guess, Mark, were you at the workshop? And if so, how did you find it? Yeah, this was a very useful workshop. This was probably the first real opportunity of replaying um, to myself and others the core outcomes from the initial interviews. So as Michael said, we had uh, a number of SMEs um, through the room, in the room through the day, uh, sales, operations, and various uh, stakeholders as part of the process. So it was useful to um, sort of listen in on you know, what was being said and opportunity to highlight any gaps you know, through that process. And it was also just an important early stakeholder engagement piece, uh, just to make sure that we had those key parties involved in the process you know, from the get-go. Um, so I did, I did find it very useful. The next part of the process was this the digital post-it notes i'm going to call it do you want to talk us through that michael mm -hmm. yeah so we then transition you know the physical wall into a digital version so we use a tool called real-time board um where we can carry the conversation after that and then you know make it use it as a, a reference point as well and so this was key to kind of um you know out of the workshop everyone who may have missed it or wants to refer back to it can find it and uh Again, with that document as well, this is a, a good you know, base point for us to go back to to see um, what is the full journey for a advisor and just refer to you know, the read parts where the pain points are, um, making sure that we are identifying and solving those problems as well. And plus a bit of priority backlog as well from that. Yeah, I think um, we found this useful too. I mean, there were a, a couple of tools, collaboration tools that were in use through the process, which was great because it wasn't, like being shared a document, then perhaps making some comments, not being sure around the feedback mechanism. Have I got the same concerns or issues as others? And so what we were collaborating on was the same you know, core platform. Um, so if we had questions or comments yeah. or disagreed or um, you know, with anything from pain points to, to content in the flow, um, it was all in one place. And so um, certainly myself and others found those platforms um, to be of, of great use through that process. Yeah, just bringing the collaboration together, right? Having one, one workspace. Yeah, so using the same tool again, we're able to then um, communicate what the design looks like in terms of the actual wireframes. And the flow you kind of see on screen here, you know, it does roughly match up to what you saw in the previous screen in terms of the, um, the advisor flow. And so again, uh, we can use this as a communication tool, um, add posts, you know, add comments here and there. Um, and it's just a good way of getting a high level view of what the entire system looks like. Um, so again, it's it's a simple way just to get a quick a quick grasp of what the the end product will will shape up to be. Why did you conduct the user testing? I know you touched on that a bit before. Yeah, so the the user testing um, prior to that, we probably spent about three weeks just getting a prototype ready. That um, it it looks real, it feels real, but it's really just mock screens. Um, and the key thing to do this is to um, ensure that we're putting a product back in front of the end user to get the initial impression to understand we're hitting the right direction. So you know, we've got previous experience in insurance and we kind of have a, a good idea of what this tool should look like, but the proof is always hearing what advisors say in the end. So that kind of validates a lot of our assumptions and it just is a good base point to kind of know that, you know, um, some of the designs may work, some of them not, and we can quickly make adjustments based off that before we hit any development work at all. Um, Mark, were you, were you at any of these user testing? No, I wasn't allowed to be. <laughs> <laughs> Just that I didn't steer it down the wrong direction. Um, but I, uh, I was actually, um, they were, um, you know, video uh, web conferencing. So I was able to, to follow the path 
which was really useful to be able to actually see that that process and and see what advisors or users were doing. I mean, as as Michael said, it was basically faked screens, but it's it's the real you know, like a real looking prototype. When you're asking a user to go and perform mm -hmm. a function, you're actually seeing the way they do it, do that in real rather than you know just being asked a question. And so so that way, when it's like, how would you add a product or how would you make a change? You can see where someone yeah. wants to move their mouse, where they want to click and get a feel for whether or not you, you need to make some change. And so it was a really useful and a really a real <laughs> yeah. um, part in the process um, to help um, you know, steer what we needed to refine. Um, yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, it was really useful. Awesome. I might throw um, to you, Michael, to talk about the next um, couple of screens around the, the prototype. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this screen here um, is a good example of how user testing is it's important to, you know, discover usability issues, but it's a good chance for us to test concepts as well. So uh, what we learned from research phase is that one way advisors share recommendations back to the client is they print out a quote and then they create a new quote and then they print that one out again and then they share, uh, share them side by side. And that process would take about 20 minutes because it, time it takes to create a new quote and you know, get the printer working and so and so. So we realized, well, why can't we just do this on screen? Now, we could tell uh, advisors about the idea and they'll probably go, okay, that's really cool, but we can't actually get a genuine impression from that unless we design it ourselves and then let them navigate to a particular screen that would show that content. And so using user testing, we can quickly you know, mock up a screen like this, um, put it in front of them and get an impression straight away. And naturally everyone was um, wowed by this, even though it's such a simple concept. Um, so it let us know quite early on that um, this concept will work really well. And uh, the fidelity you see here is rather low quality. Um, that's a good example of we wanted to test this uh, during user testing, but we couldn't actually fit it in. So overnight, we spent an hour just quickly mocking the screen up. And then the next day, we can put it back in front of advisors and then get an impression straight away. Um, so it's a good example how we can quickly get something done and validate it um, with real users. Yeah, so this is the production design screen. So I guess without user testing, you might not have understood the need for this. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, we could have got to the point where, you know, a lot further down the track, we go, okay, let's introduce, you know, a computer scenario um, concept and let's design it and build it and then release it and find out if it works or not, um, which it may or may not have. Um, and if it may not have, then we could have spent a whole bunch of effort and cost on doing that process without, you know, we could have done a lot earlier, which we did. So um, that's where you know we can validate these ideas a lot earlier on doing user testing of a mock prototype um, rather than kind of finding out later on that it may or may not work. And also just what you see here is a good example of how we do then transition from you know um, reasonably rough prototypes to uh, a polished version. So production design is where we um, make sure the designs you know um, are on brand to use the right colors, but also just does the, the concepts and um, you know the 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 use of patterns uh, makes sense as well and during the production design phase as well we you know then create a pattern library which can be passed over to development um, provide assets and so on so it's kind of more of the the supporting phase for development yeah i just i think the um benefit here was the earlier in the development process or pre-development or even i think we'd almost um started some development by this point um you're getting an idea from the users from you know the real screens and that's when you when you look at this and and, and i can recall and you know, what came out when you've had advisors or other end users looking at this, uh, the visuals more ideas can come from it like what about the output or what about this or that yeah um which is a lot you know more simple to get that sort of feedback when you've got something visual to it to work with how do you feel about the whole process um well, i think it's it's pretty clear that what we're able to do was get a clean idea early on you know, from, from the users, from advisors. And I say users because it wasn't just advisors because we're talking about you know, support staff and other yeah. external users. And so we had that, that broad and, and clean view. We're able to validate that with other information that we'd had. It gave us the opportunity to engage stakeholders you know, early in the process. And it led to when we've you know, finally executed, 
with stakeholders that had been well informed and engaged along and you know, through the whole process, having as early as possible visual representation of what we tried to do was useful for you know, making change and, and not affecting the program too much. Once again, in, engaging you know, various stakeholders. And there are times in, through the process, for example, where we had a, um, a gathering of our, our top advisors around a table um, in a forum, and I was able to, to show and get direct, direct feedback from some top advisors as well, and feed that back you know, still in the process. Um, so being able to, to bring that, that visual elements in as early as possible, rather than getting too far down the track in the standard waterfall approach, um, I think was, was you know, highly valuable and meant for a very well executed program. Um, and it's been very well regarded you know, within the group. That kind of wraps up our main uh, presentation. Um, so I'll throw to um, the audience now. If you have any questions, type them in to the question and answer panel. In the meantime though, while you guys are typing in your questions, I had a few questions of my own. Mark, how did you strike the right balance between research and design validation versus uh, build and implementation? Um, part of this, I guess, was being sufficiently agile, not in just you know, the, the development or the, the, the sprint approach, but just in the general thinking and you know, the preparedness to adjust you know, along the way. We were keen to get the early guidance, um, which I think we did really well. Um, but then it was all, all also important to realise that you were going to be doing more testing. You were going to be getting to the point of beta testing, which we also did, and you might need further change. So we kind of broke it up into two key components in my mind. Um, one was getting that design right, and the other one was when we're actually developing it, let's be ready to adjust on the fly as quickly as possible um, so that we could get to a point of, of delivering something that was um, as strong as it could be. And so that's simplistically the way I broke it into those two pieces, um, which, which worked pretty well. It did absolutely um, you know, put pressure on the program. We had a, a lot to do, as I said, multiple vendors trying to, to collaborate appropriately uh, to bring it all together. Um, but you know, the proof's in the pud. We, uh, we executed very well. Um, we've transitioned off an old system um, with excellent feedback from the market. And so... I think that's yeah, it, it's all worked out, you know, very well through that process. I should add there was there were other elements and measures along the way, um, and I'm not sure that Michael mentioned, but you know, even things like the NPS and, and usability ratings go yeah. you know, through the process and, and really testing back against whether you're hitting the mark, and that was that was useful on its own too to make sure that we were just continually checking in mm -hmm. um, that we were heading towards uh, our initial objectives. Um, and single-minded about that, single-minded about the fact that it was experience was the core focus. And when you've got that as a, a key focus, it becomes less about simply delivering a program on the day it needs to be delivered yeah. than actually delivering the minimum lovable product that you want to get to market that's going to you know, provide you the end result. Yes, yeah, so that's a bit of a mind shift, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah. What was the biggest unexpected challenge? Um, for me, probably, um, you know, I'm not a technical expert. Um, I'm more of a business driver and appreciating uh, elements such as testing probably are, you know, that was probably one of the bigger impacts in the, um, the time frame. And the fact that you are being as agile as possible with design means that you're actually putting a bit more pressure towards the tail end of the program with the amount of testing on a not yet finished you know, product. And so that was probably, um, that put a bit more pressure at the tail end, um, but I wouldn't change it. Uh, the bottom line is, is the way that we worked, the way that we were sufficiently agile and, and able to, um, to mould to the needs that we're rechecking in along the way. Um, but certainly I'd, um, that, that's one, that the element of testing is one thing to be aware of and, and sufficiently allow for that, uh, that in timelines. Um, but we certainly made sure that we had sufficient rounds so that what we end up going to production with was strong. Um, we did end up going pilot with a smaller group um, for around two, two to three weeks prior to the broad launch, um, just to give us a little bit more um, around the risk mitigation through that process as well. So how did you balance the agile delivery approach with you know, executive expectations on, on scope and spend? Um, with difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think 
the um, most importantly overall here was when we put did the original business case was that design was in it. At that point, I didn't know what it was going to cost. I didn't know how long it was going to take. Um, but the bottom line was I had the commitment that we had design you know, at the core. As it turned out, we did adjust. Once the program had started, we did adjust the need. Um, you know, as a group, we weren't sufficiently familiar with how to deal with design, how to be more agile yeah. you know, with our programs. And so there was a lot of learning through the process. Um, and so there was a, you know, pain pain through that process and um, you know, with, uh, with, with running the program effectively. Um, but as I say, the, the commitment up front, um, as long as you've then got that and the preparedness to adjust, the preparedness to have be keep to, to your single-minded, in this case, approach of um, being about experience, yeah. um, meant that it was a good story to fit to. Um, the fact that we were able to have very early in the program feedback, ratings, um, replay around that advisor interview process meant that that could feed back into the steering committee, meant that we were having more insightful based decision making through the process and we weren't waiting for beta testing the day before launch uh, on a program, you know, yeah. it was, was very early in the, in the process. So. I had one more question just around what did success look like? What does, what was the outcome of this project? Yeah, well, um, our uh, business case fundamentally um, when it comes to the dollars is around growth of footprint, is around doing more business, which mm -hmm. comes from improving the experience. Um, so we had a number of measures, you know, uh, which we came back to things like NPS and, and usability scores, and so absolutely they were they were core. But you know that's um, that then should result in you know, more users. We since since launch have grown our user base um, by between fifteen and twenty percent, which is a clear indication for me of a number of factors: you know, improving experience for existing or past users. Yeah. To um, but there was also some just technical and architectural elements. You know, we weren't available on all devices previously. Um, so we, we grew footprint through a number of, of methods and we've, we've grown sales as a result. And so at the end of the day, when the CEO wants improved sales numbers, we've got those metrics, you know, that we've met quite well. When you're talking about sales activity and are we actually providing improvements to the early part of the funnel? So are we doing more quotes with more people that theoretically will result in more business? Absolutely, mm. you know, from the various stakeholders, users, internal and external, um, you know, what level of issues, complaints, heat tickets through our <laughs> through our help desk have we got? You know, all those those different measures of yeah. of are we prov have we provided something clean and clear and crisp that is usable uh, and is low on the issues factor? All those numbers for us have been very good. So, I don't think we could have achieved that if we didn't have collaboration between. You know, development, you know, multiple providers, um, and having having early insights into what that minimum lovable product would look like. Yeah. Um, yeah. In my case, a lovable product. <laughs> <laughs> we get viable. That's not good enough. <laughs> yeah. Lovable. That's great. So I'd like, just like to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you to Mark and Michael for your time and sharing your experiences. So thanks everyone, and have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Bye.